Greetings. Welcome to the Asana Kitchen Podcast. I'm David Garig, and before we get started, I just wanted to let you know I have this uh, Mysore class that's focusing on the foundations uh, in May. So it's going to meet every Thursday from 9 to 10.30. It's for all students, but definitely for students that have never studied with me before. And you have to be ready to focus on the foundations of like Surya Namaskara, standing poses, and inversions. And there will be times like that I will uh, be working with the group. So it's like part Mysore, part group. You'll start on, say, Surya Namaskara for 15 minutes, and then I'll uh, give individual instructions. But then I will also highlight something somebody's doing and get the whole group to pay attention to and try that, like a plank exercise or going to upward dog. Then we'll move on to standing postures and do that for a period of time. Okay, so if you're interested in that, you can find out more about it on my website. So anyway, today's podcast, we've got a, a triple theme and that is quite uh, large, but uh, we're going to see if we can tie it together. Joy was asking about her, her, the, the infinite and emptying the mind and yoga siddhis or the powers. Okay, so well, first, one of the main things you do with yoga, one of the main practices is to contemplate the distinction between spirit and matter. It's called purusha is spirit or drashtahu, that means um, seer and um, prakriti or nature, or the physical world versus the spiritual world. And then the spiritual self, or the spiritual dimension of you versus the material dimension. It can be a very a lifelong kind of profound contemplation, but it can all, it, it also starts off very basic, like just making two categories and listing the, the differences. And certain differences really st stand out. And one is that the material world, the physical world, the, the physical you is finite, whereas the purusha, the seer, the self is infinite. But what does it mean practically? And when I'm thinking for myself, like when I want to uh, get things for myself or protect myself, um, if I kind of build this isolated world that's good for David, but not considering the entirety, this is finite and this is limited. And so the, the whole contemplation of the infinite is the infinite power of love so that when you come to a spiritual dimension or a spiritual perspective on your life, it's, it's much more all-encompassing and, and much more powerful. And so they say that self is all-powerful, uh, all-knowing, and all-giving, whereas self is limited in, in those things. It's the power that you can be as, with your ego is very limited. The other thing that you with the infinite that you want to think about and that has to do with the empty mind, it's 100% pure. And so there's an infinite aspect to that and an infinite space within the mind, like the, the, the state of Nirodaha. Are there any sutras that specifically talk about the infinite? Yeah, there are. One distinct one is in the Yoga Sutras on Asana. It's the second of the three. So the first one, Stira Sukham Asana the steady and agreeable. That's how the posture should be. And then it says, prayatna shaitilya ananta samapatipyam. So it's saying that there's a kind of relaxation of effort that happens. And ananta is infinity or the infinite. And samapati is a cognitive blending with the infinite. So there's like a merging with infinity or, or this, what I say is a, you take on the contemplation of infinity um, in your asana, that that's partly what happens when you make a, stead a steady and agreeable asana. And it's a very hard thing to take on. How do you contemplate infinity? Like the, the thing going on forever, never, everlasting. And that's another aspect of self, that the, this self, the, the David, the body, the personality, that all dies, so it's finite. But the, the this self that's the, the spiritual self that's infinite love is also eternal. So it's a, it's a 
ever, it, it always was, it always will be. And, and so you're supposed to contemplate those differences. And you can do it in this kind of intellectual way like we are right now. Mm -hmm. But then I, what I, that's what I love about the asana practice. And it's a particular specialty of, me, of mine is to try to take the, the most profound yoga concepts and turn them into direct things you're doing in practice. Okay, and so to me, you actually have to have exercises in ananta samapati. So you, meaning exercises to blend cognitively with the infinite. You can't, that it, it's not just enough to think about it, even though that's important. And, and that's why I love the work with the limbs. Okay, because that's a big thing that I, I say. That, so your limbs, your arms and your legs, they're the foundation of your posture, almost invariable, and almost invariably. There's a, there's a few uh, anomaly postures where like your belly is the foundation or something else. But most postures, it's your arms and your legs in combination with each other that are the foundation of your pose. And part of what makes that foundation sound is to turn your limbs into levers. And that it, a lever is a long, strong instrument that, do, that you do work with. And, that, the, and the work is to make the foundation to support your spine. And, and so th the lever is both long and strong. And so this is something you're continually doing is you're lengthening your limbs and you, you as a contemplation of infinity. So that like when you're standing in triangle, your legs get taller and taller the longer you stay. And, and, and this is a direct way that you can like do, it's like a mantra or a, a, a yantra. It's like you're, it's a meditative device that brings insight, brings knowledge to you. And so when you reach through your arms, when you reach up in Surya Namaskara or reach out horizontally in Warrior Two, you're imagining your arms extend into space infinitely from shoulder to fingertips. And, and like this, it's this, continual thing that's happening. It's like a, a never ending. A and it, it, it's a very potent uh, mind focusing device because what we will tend to do when we make a foundation of our pose is set our legs or arms and then forget about them. Okay, but, the, and, but, but you're meant to keep consciousness in your limbs. So you can kind of keep feeding your foundation. And so you can get this um, asana skill because that's what the, those three sutras on asana in the third chapter, they're, they're, they're a recipe for skillful asana. So when you can make your asana about contemplating infinity, then you get the powerful asana. And then you said that infinity was part of emptying the mind. Yeah. So because because for well for one that there, there's a purity that the infinite and purity go together. That like that like pure space. Pure space is infinite. Infinite, right? And so when but and thoughts coming arising into the mind field crowds the space, takes up space, limits the space. And also, especially when you identify with those thoughts coming in the mind. So when you cease, and partly when you identify with the, the thoughts that are coming in the mind, you're, you are bound to react to those thoughts that are coming. So with desire or aversion, and, and then that will tend to create more of them. Right. <laughs> Right. And so, so to drop your identification with thought and let the mind settle is it, it's kind of a purity of mind that the field is pure. It's, it's empty. It doesn't, there's not thoughts rising and passing away on it. And so there's an infinite quality and there's an ability to uh, contemplate the in, infinite too, when you're not wrapped up in smaller concerns that are 
all tied up with the finite you. So contemplating infinity then is a, what's the word for subtle again in the Sanskrit? Sukshma. Okay, so contemplating infinity is a shukshma is even more subtle, obviously, than like, you know, external rotation or something right, like that, but, right? Right, but the whole idea of infinitely lengthening your arms and legs in a posture, that to me is not subtle. That's what's uh, the beauty of it. It's very tangible and uh, amazing device that will immediately transform your physical posture and start to give you like a sense of this infinite or a connection with, with it. So it's not as subtle as it could be. Like, or, and it can be more subtle than that. Like that's just, it's not that subtle, my feeling is that especially if you're a veteran of practice, you just start applying it. And it, and it applies to every, it, it applies to, so when your arms are fully extended, but it also applies to like when you're in forearm balance. And so your, your, your forearm, it, it, it plant, you plant it on the ground and it extends towards infinity. Or your leg, when you're in warrior, that thigh, it's only your thigh, the, the thigh bone, but you imagine that going to infinity. Or when you're in Buddha Konasana. So any part of you, part of your arm, part of your leg, anything that has length, you can really work on this and have an, a super tangible advice, uh, device to get at a subtle yoga concept. So there's this really amazing interview with Agnes Martin where she talks about how, you know, she has no thoughts anymore. I mean, she went through a period of time where she meditated and whatnot, but at this point now, I think she was 84 in the interview. And- That fits. She, <laughs> she, <laughs> she you literally see footage of her sitting in her art studio and she's just sitting in a chair. And then she just waits and waits. And then she'll get up and she'll paint. And she talks about how she only paints according to inspiration. Yeah. So how often in your practice do you find that, that, that you're leading by inspiration? And that you have an empty mind and it's inspiration that you're leading by. Yeah. And so it's a it's a really big uh, topic with me right now, actually, in my practice, like okay. because um, it because to me it's the whole idea of pravritti, higher thought, so that you're there's for for years and years you you have to work you have to do things like direct your mind into your arms and stretch them towards infinity. And, and you have to rotate your joints and do so many actions and so many deliberate uh, mental devices to um, activate your body in the pose. But, but that ends. It's like a training wheel. It's a, it's a thing you let go of. And it's, um, it's something very scary in a way to drop all of that and just empty out and uh, purposely not think and not and not not go to those devices not like like because so spend so much time like consciously applying them right and and building the asana off of that um but well, then drills and drills drills and just, yeah so much repetition yeah, but you're right, but but there's a difference because you can still be doing the drills and repetition and be in a state of nirodha. You don't have to be not moving. Right. Yeah. 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 So you, it's not whether you're doing a drill or not. It's what's going on in your mind while you're doing the drill. Oh. And see, there's a huge difference between um, not paying attention or j like the Nike, just do it. It's not like that. Okay. That's that's like way to the novice, okay? So, you, no, you've gone through this intense process of thought and um, 
pravritti, higher thought, strategy, activating, just deep study of how to activate and account for every single part of your body when you're in a pose. But then you let go of all that. You drop it. And it's true. It, it, it's, it's, it's a pursuit of being, I don't know, 60 or older. <laughs> I mean, yeah. really, to really to open into that and explore that. It's like you're preparing the ground with your pravritti, your activations for decades. Well, she, I mean, she talks about how she was 60 when she felt like she started to be able to really create in this emptiness. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it's terrifying. It's, it's, it's terrifying. And we don't even know how terrified we are of it. Of, but what we do is we fill up our minds. And so we'll, and we fill, we fill up our minds with uh, vritti, just random thought or um, gross thought that causes us suffering. But then we also fill up our mind with pravritti, with, with higher thoughts and, and with actions and things. And, and so to actually drop all of that is terrifying. And so, okay. So for me, you... anyway. And no, it's definitely, no. Yeah, and, <laughs> no, it's but, definitely terrifying. But it's, but it's also, but it's, it's relieving too. That's the thing. It's, it's like coming home. It's this beautiful, uh, not even, not beautiful even, just uh, raw. It's a place where the human being belongs. Like, and so the fear of it is superficial compared to the settlement that comes when you let go and be there in whatever place that is. And um, I call it also, it's a place of trust. It's a receptivity because the because the this self kind of this essence or spiritual dimension it's it's in the background and it needs that um, relinquishment of your your own will and your own ego and your own um, trying to direct everything to come forth to be to even make itself known to you and to kind of yeah, become part of you and to like for to you to blossom into you or whoever that uh, deeper, more profound self is. So how are you? Why is it that you're saying this is a big topic right now in my practice? What do you because can you give me an example because in some ways I, I in some ways I really have explored the pravritti to the ends in terms of the trico not just in terms everything of every transition every <laughs> asana every leg position like and and but and but part of me still keeps doing it keeps grounding my femur and it's like but but i know that there or i and i feel that there's that, that that there's something unsatisfying. There's something that it doesn't it, it it doesn't do everything. There's something missing. There's something more there. There's and there's and there's something um, unhealthy or unhealing about not going to this place of dropping and emptying out. There's something like uh, growth stunting. It's like, no, something's wrong here. Hmm. Got to let go and drop and just whatever that is. And and be clear, though, it's not the same as just kind of doing it. No, it's, it's a very different state of it's a that's what's so amazing about it. And that's why why the it's called the infinite and why it's infinite power, infinite knowing. So it's this total awakeness that there's no room for, for a conjecture or kind of sort for an argument or a comparison about whether you should rotate this way or if it's lengthening enough or doing this or like those types of thoughts just don't belong. But and, and the thing and we haven't brought Siddhi into this, but Siddhi. No, I know. I just want to say one thing. Okay. That 
I don't know if you actually did coin this, but you definitely for the first time said it in Kovalem like five years ago, where you said there's a whole lot of thinking that goes into not thinking. Right. Did, I don't know if you actually you know, made that up. Yeah, but no, I, yeah. But, but now... I just don't want anyone to get confused here. Though. Yeah, a whole <laughs> lot of thinking goes into not thinking, but but then my, the new saying is, but, but not thinking is a bigger piece of the pie than any thinking you'll ever do. Hmm. That's the thing, is don't forget. Yeah. Yeah. And, and catch glimpses of it. Even if, even if you're in the midst of scouring through your body and bringing intelligence everywhere, keep glimpsing the background of, of that where those, those, those actions can come from a deeper source. They don't have to come from, from a kind of crude use of your will. Like, and at first they do. It's like a crude, yeah, like you manually take control of your body and your breathing and your energy. But, but, but once you get that really going, you can, it'll, it, it can do it. And do you think that having that pranayama practice is an essential step, like an essential bridge? I mean, it says... I think, no, this is what I think. I think... I, mean, I don't want to be one of those people. No, <laughs> not having a pranayama practice. That's, it's a mistake. It... It's to turn, you basically transform your asana practice into a pranayama practice. That has to happen. Okay. Not that you need to go sit down and do pranayama a whole bunch. I mean, that, that can be good. But the, the, the part of this mastery that I'm talking about, part of pravritti or higher thought is mastering the breath. So Vayu the siddhi. So, okay. So, but the kum, the actual catching of the kumbhaka, isn't that supposed to show you the emptiness? Yeah. But you can find that in the asana practice. No, you're right. You're. It's a good dimension to explore, the mm -hmm. pranayama, and, and and partly because of its, the kumbhaka, the retention where things really do stop more than, ordinarily, like that, of all the physical things that can stop. You can say pranayama might be the essence of that or the maximum of what stops physically. Yeah. Right? So that so Naroda has part physical stopping. Okay, that's and, and you explore that to its ends, and Kumbhaka helps you to do that. But but also it's not entirely that because you don't stop your blood from flowing, you don't stop your heart from beating. Right, you don't stop your nerves from flowing, so that no matter how much stopping you do physically, that's not nirodha. Nirodha is ceasing to identify with the movement and activity. See, this is big. Okay, and so you you have to, and and that's partly what it means to settle is that you don't pay attention to the thoughts that are coming and going. You don't give value to them. See, and that's what Agnes Martin and she's partly doing. And, and when you don't give value to them, then they, well, they don't hold as much weight in your mind and you don't react off of them. But, so, but and also they go away eventually. Now, Siddhi, see, Siddhi is such an interesting concept. So it means, um, I, I give it, I love these three definitions that, and they're all kind of separate. Mastery, perfection, and power. And this is exactly what, what we're talking about. And because to understand the infinite power of, your, of the spiritual dimension of life, the infinite power of love, the infinite power of generosity, the infinite power of charity and of um, unity, this is the ultimate power. Siddhi, and this is the ultimate perfection of the human being. Okay, so the, when the human being becomes perfect when we transcend our little self and we live for the entirety. Okay, th that's when a human being is at their best, their most powerful, and, and, and when they're kind of maximizing their life. And, um, and so, so Siddhi, 
is it's a mastery of your body and your mind to be able to identify with that deeper dimension of life and and not let the your ego with your your fears and your worries about and concerns with your own well-being your own body that you're able to transcend those things and um okay but but see this is the amazing thing about cindy and, and, oh is that it's also very small and tangible and you can put it right to play into play in your asana practice and this is what i want to spend the last of this podcast with you on but i but i will say just to illustrate that so there's the eight famous siddhis okay that um they're, they're, they're the classic ones if you can look them up on google and they they are very grand I'll go through them real quick with you. So one, one is the Garima Siddhi. It's the power to make yourself weigh, become infinitely heavy. Okay, and then there's Lagima Siddhi, where the power to make yourself infinitely light. Okay, then there's um, Anima and Mahima, which is the power to make yourself anatomically small, like an atom size, or the Mahima is to make yourself infinitely large. Okay, so like the, basically they're mythological powers that, that you find in the stories. And um, then the other three are the ability to acquire anything anywhere. It's called Prapti. And then Ishtva and Vashitva are the lordship over the entire creation and then the ability to control the creation. And... Um, and so you can see that the, these eight famous siddhis are very grand, right? And they're, in fact, to me, they're so grand that they've fallen out of favor, that no one pays any attention to them anymore because how, will, how can this apply to me? Like, right? But it's also a psychic thing. No, I, mean... I know. And I'm going to go through <laughs> it with you, though. No, okay. But, but yeah. no, but okay. But you're right. People no, are so literal now. That, that... Well, and that it takes some extra work to go, okay, wait a minute. What, how is that a power? The, the ability to increase your weight. And, and see, and me, I always do this. I always, I, I'm like, I'm selfish about it. See, because in some ways I'm backwards and I, I admit it. I love asana. Okay, I always have. I, I've always loved asana just for itself. And I know that's backwards. You're, you're supposed to love asana as the third limb. That, that, so you climb up the eight limbs to get to yoga, right? But I love asana. I always have. It's, and, and it's taken me time to love the rest of yoga, actually. <laughs> yeah. And, and so partly I selfishly approach every Thing in yoga, every philosophy, everything I come across, every teaching in terms of, okay, how does this help my asana? I'm serious. That's where I go with it. Okay. And, and these siddhis are incredible helpers. Okay. And so the first one is the ability to increase your weight at will. Okay. This is principle to making your posture. Okay, and, and so the master or to get that special power, of Garima Siddhi, it means like you can wield your weight. So it means that with your mind, you can decide that your feet or your legs weigh way more than they actually do. So you can like funnel weight into your body and, and make your foundation uh, deeper. This is a big thing in the asana. And I want to read you this, this thing that comes from um, Bess Mensendick, which she was like a Here's what I think of this woman as. She, she was, her dharma was to elevate the act of standing to a spiritual experience. That's all. She studied Samastitihi her entire life and, and wrote about Samastitihi. And so, in one of her books, she talks about the weights of the body masses. Okay, and, 
So, and she gives this diagram where she sections the body off into different weights. And like, for instance, with a 150 pound person, she gives the head weighs 10 pounds, the torso weighs 70 pounds, each thigh weighs 15 pounds. Okay, and your thighs, so that's 30 pounds between the, the two thighs. And your arms are approximately 10 pounds each. Um, and she even divides like the upper arm is five pounds, the forearm is four pounds. And, and then she says that, um, listen to this statement. So she, she says that thinking of your body in terms of a uh, set of body weights and sections of weights, here's what she says. This conception of body masses as weighing individual and different amounts will clarify and help solve the problem of both movement and posture. Yeah, that's just the very fact of thinking of your body as being made up of weights. And then she says, so if we conceive of the body in this manner as being made up of these sections of weight, then the correct upright posture cannot be anything else but the proper super superposition of these various individual weights from the feet upwards. And then it becomes obvious that the correct super in superposition does not depend upon the opinions of teachers and artists, but it rests entirely upon the unchangeable laws of statics and mechanics. Okay, so my point is, Garima Siddhi is a deep asana siddhi. So you start wielding your arms and legs and really feeling their weight feeling the weight of your head and your torso and manipulating those weights on purpose and, and getting power. And that, that small, it's like reaching through your arms to contemplate infinity. When you get Garima Siddhi, then you're, you, what Joy said in the beginning, it's a psychic thing. So it's, it means you can wield your weight. It means you, you can emphasize what you want to it means you can take a stance on something especially a stance on your spiritual uh on this spiritual dimension and looking to the infinite power and the infinite weight of love and generosity and unity and these things that we deeply need right now okay and then um the and if you look at lagima siddhi it's a same that's the light one. That's the light one. It's the ability to make yourself light. And so that to me, that's buoyancy. It's like, and floating and um, flying and soaring. It's like, so that just like you want to be able to root and just stamp your legs and, and fix them in position, you want to be able to make your spine fly up or fly out on the horizontal axis and turn. That's totally part of the um, asana mastery. Okay, but then also the ability to be light is to, the ability to let go of heavy states. Okay, so that uh, darkness, depression, lethargy, uh, anger, your grudges, all these things that weighed us down, you're, you're able to go within and uh, and sift and sort and breathe and be become conscious and process your emotions and find out what belongs where and what action is needed if any action is needed in response to the emotions that you have okay and so and the uh the so this ability to become small or large to me, it's those in an when to translate those into an asana is like this. It's just this simple. Sometimes you're focusing on the minutest detail. Hmm. Okay, very very specific. What your finger is doing, what the what an, one knuckle is doing. So fine is your awareness. And, and riveted down to the most microscopic level. And then you can pull back out to the most broad. 
and, and, and involve your entire body in a symphonic effort. And you're, you have the ability to, to shift back and forth between this smallness and this largeness. And um, there you go. Okay, and then I love this prapti um, siddhi. The, so to, the, it means to obtain prapti. It means to, the ability to acquire anything, anywhere. Okay, and this does not mean you can materialize, like Sai Baba materializes an orange out of nowhere. No, that is not, it's not a, like a magician's trick. You're not Houdini. Yeah, you're, or a different kind of Houdini. What it means is that basically it means you have the ability to make the very best out of every situation. So whatever's at hand, you're going to maximize it. And your mind is going to think sharp and be able to, to acquire whatever it needs to do what it needs to do to, that you can do, acquire whatever you need to do in the moment and using what is ever available. So there's a very, um, you're a pro at this, Joy. That's one of the <laughs> things I admire about you the most. So you're, you, you constantly are doing that. It's like your mind works so fast to use what is available and make the very best of what is there. And, and, and the opposite is to fall into despair because you because you don't have what you need or the perfect setting or the perfect circumstances aren't there and then then you're you kind of shut down around that because you don't have the resources of what you need so that so you're working to flip your mind okay and then there's i'm not going to talk about those other two at the moment because i want to there's some additional cities that i want to talk about and um and the 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 third sutra in the that's on asana in the yoga sutras so it's after the one about contemplating infinity it says tato dwandwa anabhigataha so it's and it's basically a siddhi that it, it means that the dwandwas are pairs of opposites okay and you can say that almost all pravritti okay almost all the higher thought that you use to bring about a state of no thought is the ability to pit one force against another. So pairs of opposites um, fighting it out to find a middle. Okay, and this says that your that sutra, tato dwandwa anabhigataha, it means you're not aggravated by, you're not constrained, you're not upset by the plays of pairs of opposites. So when forces and counterforces are meeting each other and there's tension and there's... Um, action and and power in play you're you're okay you're fine with it you're in the middle uh cool and th so it's called a dwandwa siddhi a dwandwa is um opposite and a is the opposite of opposite so you're you're so you have this ability to withstand opposing forces with equanimity and cultivate them and really play forces off of each other in a free flows of energy. And this is very empowering and leads to this middle place, which is the emptying of the mind or the, the calm in the storm. I yeah. was just reading um, um, some Tarkovsky and he was talking about, he uses opposing forces. Yeah. He actually uses that term yeah and just talking about how that is where art is created yeah you know, in that middle when those two forces are opposing each other and to equate now what you're saying the art to the empty mind yeah right? I mean that's so beautiful yeah and how the the middle or that empty place is not a place that where opposites aren't butting up against each other right right that because you can get that feeling that it's some kind of like lackluster place of Land. Yeah, but no, 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 it's not. It's full of dynamism. Okay, so these next two, what I love about them is that they bring the senses into the Siddhi realm. Hmm. Okay, so the the Garima Siddhi brought, brings in the limbs because you're working with weighting your limbs, right? But so Dura Shravana and Dura Darshana, 
That's hearing far or seeing far. Okay, and so these are so key to the asana practice. Okay, is to make, to, to get suprasensory activity happening. Like, the, the, wake your eyes up. And so you, you see your body, like literally look at your body in your practice. Change your drishti so you can see what you're doing. But it's more than that. It's like penetrating inside the flesh, inside the bones, and being far seeing. So you're able to see the relationships between your joints, the relationship between your, your arms and your spinal column, and your pelvis and your spine, and your pelvis and your legs, and your feet and your head. And so you, all this perceptual accuracy comes. And then the hearing, too. So that th there's a, a process of actually listening to your breath and even your thoughts and things. Um, so, so it's a physical far listening or hearing, but it's also psychic. It's like listening within and understanding how to negotiate the, the, those three things of vritti, so just random thought that's coming and going, pravritti, where you've, you're directing your thoughts towards specific projects that are leading to nirvritti or, or this emptying of the mind and being able to negotiate those by listening to what you're communicating to yourself and what is communicate what's what's communicating through you what's coming right cuz the so partly the nirodaha state the the emptying of the mind is an invitation for new knowledge different knowledge from a deeper source to come well that yeah i mean that just takes us full circle where i was saying how you know that agnes martin and she's like i i, I paint when there's inspiration exactly you and, know, yeah. that she's a channel. And yeah. I, I mean, I definitely yes. feel that. I'm amazed sometimes when I'm like, I don't know how the hell that just happened, came to me, but it did. Yeah. You know? And right. And that can happen to you in your asana. It, really, it's supposed to happen to you, not it can happen to you. But you have to really work because you have to negotiate it. Right? Because you can't start from the place of Narodaha. That's the trick. If you, if you try to start there, you're just going to fool yourself. So you have to prepare the ground of your mind and body. And, um, and then just a few more. Um, one is, you've, those of you that know me, you've heard me talk about this one. Manoja Vitva. So that swiftness of mind is a siddhi. Okay? So your mind gets razor sharp, and this is how you want to get with your pravrittis. Okay, so when you activate your feet, legs, pelvis, spine, arms, hands, you that all happens in an instant. It happens so swiftly because you're present and your mind is sharp. Okay, and that's a city. But interestingly, in one, at least one translation of Manoja Vitva, it's saying the physical body is swift. That it's like uh, that you can swiftly assemble your body into a shape, and that comes to the next uh, siddhi, which is Kama Rupa Siddhi, which is you the ability to assume the desired form. <laughs> Kama is desire, Rupa is form. And this is an exact asana siddhi, right? That's what you're working to do, is have the ability to swiftly assume the desired form. And it's a physical thing. It's an asana, but it's also a perspective. It's a, it's a psychic uh, form of clearing out your mind and understanding the background of reality this consciousness that's in the background that's infinite that's eternal that's perfect that's complete and that is you there you have it uh, hopefully that will inspire you to get on your mat and uh, 
get those cities rocking. In May, I'm doing a Foundations Mysore class. Okay, so it's for students that, um, it's open to students that haven't studied with me before, but it's also open to students that have studied with me, but you have to be ready to stop. So it's not your everyday Mysore. There's, there's some kind of group interaction where I'll call, I'll spotlight somebody and point out a certain thing uh, that has to do with the standing posture or the inversion or something and get everybody kind of trying things out together. Okay, so you can find out more about that on my website. And you, you do need to apply for it. So you'll go to the asanakitchen at gmail.com and tell David a little bit about your practice and mostly why you want to take the class. Yeah, and, and also just kind of explicitly agreeing that I'm not just coming and doing my practice, that we're really kind of deep, we're trying to explore the foundations of practice. And, okay, so anyway, thank you for joining me and be well.